Christian Fellowship on this Father's Day. We are thankful that you are here, and uh, we know that uh, we've got those that are out with their fathers at other churches and other places, but we're glad that you're here with us, and those of you that are watching by live streaming, we appreciate you uh, here being a part of it. If you look in your bulletin, uh, we've got the different prayer requests list. Uh, Andy's going to be having surgery. Wave at me, Andy. Andy's back there. He's going to be having surgery uh, Wednesday, so be in prayer for him, add him. But you can see uh, the ones there uh, that we have. Any other prayer requests that you would like to add? Anybody have anything they want to add? Yes, I'll get that in a second, with Amy. Okay. Right. That. Right. When they deactivate your defibrillator, yeah, it's one of those things of saying the end is coming soon. So be in prayer for them as they go through it. Uh, hang on, I gotta go to Paula first, and then I go to you, Steve. Well, yeah. I have a couple. Um, I have arthritis in both my knees, so I have to go to orthopedic on the fifth for my knees, and then my right toe is crossing over my big toe, so I have to go on the third for that. So wow. pray for that. They're okay. saying it's working arthritis, and I'm a CNA, so pray for that. I might have to find another job. Wow. Okay. And then Amy, Amy's back at home uh, with a friend in Manassas, but they have, I guess because they wanted his address, so the cops going to be looking out for her. Uh, Praise God, God spared her life because she could have been gone that Monday. Right. Um, but she has court on the 27th, but she's told me the one in Manassas is more unlikely she might be going to rehab somewhere. I don't know how long, but she said the one in Manassas <coughs> is really telling her that she needs to either go to rehab or she's going to jail. Do pray in prayer for this situation, but obviously uh, the challenge is in the heart. People uh, take substances because there's an emptiness inside or they've been wounded or hurt or they're trying to medicate the problem away. We understand that Jesus Christ is the only thing that can, can heal wounded hearts, so we want to go to that. Yes? Just testimony, actually. All right, quick. First of all, we serve a mighty God. Amen. Amen. We have been praying for the Justice family because uh, the head of that family recently took a fall within the hospital. He, uh, he couldn't breathe, and they put him on a ventilator system, and they said that uh, he probably wouldn't last a week, uh, and he would never come out of that. And Marilyn and I went in to see him. We thought one last time, and I laid hands on him and prayed for him for a healing with that little bit of doubt in my mind saying that this is probably a waste of prayer. And then God wanted to turn around and teach me a lesson. Uh, we went in to see him yesterday, yesterday, yesterday morning, and he is sitting up in his bed and he's Amen. talking to people and Amen. carrying on. God's not done with him yet, and he certainly is not done teaching me a lesson about prayer. Amen. <laughs> I like the prayer that the guy said, God, I, uh, Lord, I believe, help my own belief. Yeah. Yeah. Aubrey. Dad jammed my thumb. Your dad jammed your thumb? <laughs> <laughs> so you ratted him out on Father's Day, didn't you? But we were going to pray for your thumb and, and pray that your dad won't jam your thumb anymore, right? <laughs> He's sorry. He's <laughs> repeated it. Forgive the guy. Somebody over here. I, yes, Rosemary. Um, the girl, Carrie, that we've been praying for, she wanted to transition to a man. Her mom wouldn't agree to the surgery, so she was waiting for her 18th birthday. Had it scheduled, and by the grace of God and our prayers, it has been postponed, and now the doctors say they probably can't even get her on the schedule till the fall. Now... Those who have been in this church a long time, 16 years ago, we were praying against a girl having an abortion, and every time she went for the abortion, there was something wrong, and her rides fell through, and one thing, and of course back then, you get too far along, they wouldn't do it. And he's a wonderful young man, adopted, 
into a family. And so I'm praying this is the same thing, that God is just going to keep postponing it until he puts somebody in her path to see that she's beautiful the way she is. Um, the problem now has been her mom took her to counseling, and the counselors have convinced mom this is just a syndrome and it's natural, and so mom is kind of more supportive and on board now than she was, letting her have this surgery to remove all her female parts. So um, please continue to pray for Kiri. Um, and then we have a praise report. We were praying for Catherine Higginbotham, yes. who's a cancer survivor very low immune and she broke out in these hives and insane itching that has all cleared up amen yeah. so amen. she's doing better and thank you for the prayers for Catherine. those who who are unhappy with themselves in in any form or fashion begin to try to find some external thing to change to change the feeling of i don't have value i'm not special i'm not desirable i'm not worthy and you can do all the outward things you want to but until you trust the creator God who created you uniquely for your his purpose and that you glorify God <coughs> if you will submit to him and understand the beauty of who and what he made you to be that's where your peace and your joy and your purpose and your meaning I'm a dried up old guy. And you know what? I'm a dried up old guy to the glory of God. I love being me. And that's what God produces because when I was younger, I wouldn't have said that. I would have changed things and rearranged things and made things differently. But because I understand that my life is not my own, it's God's. And he created me for a purpose and a reason just the way I am. And so... Uh, it gives great peace. So we'll pray for a continued pushing back so this individual can hear truth <coughs> that we pray will set them free. Yes? Yes, I have a friend whose sister-in-law was just recently uh, diagnosed with a brain tumor. Okay. So Remember that. Yes, Johnny? Oh, yeah, we're going to pray for Vinda, but we're not going to do right now. But I'll, I'll mention her. Uh, Vinda's knees and stuff have been bothering her such she really can't come up to the platform. So um, here shortly, uh, we're going to be, uh, uh, deacons, we're going to come over and anoint her with oil and, and I pray for her because that's what scripture says do. Yes, Bubba? I got a praise report. I like praise reports. Go ahead. Rhonda Clemens, it was in the church prayer thing. Yep. She went to Operation Wednesday. Yep. And then they time that they went in, they said it'd be longer. Uh -huh. They knocked it out quicker. She was up, <coughs> ready to come home that night, and it made her stay in the hospital one more night. She was up doing good. So Amen. Praise. Praise the Lord for that. Anything else before we pray? Yes? We didn't really met this guy yesterday. He was named Bill. He carried around a big 10 to 12 foot tall cross around him. Let him talk for a few minutes, say the things about Jesus. Him being the testament. Amen. Do pray for our country. Pray for all the different needs and things. All right. Yeah, oh, sorry. Terry? Pray for Aaron. He's had a couple MRIs, and we still don't have answers for his back. I didn't know she was doing that. Well, I know. I, 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 you know how I knew your eyes went from this big to this big. <laughs> but isn't it nice to have a wife that loves you and realizes that, you know, uh, we believe God has something better for him, and we want to know what that is, so be in prayer for that. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. It is quite appropriate that on this day especially I call you Father. We're going to be looking at and thinking about what a good father is. But you're a perfect father. And your ability to be what we need as we turn to you. We have a free will. We can run to our Heavenly Father or we can run from Him. And Father, life has taught me that the only way I want to live life is in your arms. Submitted to you. Not just so I can have the good things you do, but knowing you. 
what a wonderful blessing to have a personal relationship with a father who just happens to be the God of all creation, universe, and beyond. Lord, you know the needs that we have. And I want to thank you for you allowing us to have these needs. We, we have a tendency to be self-sufficient. We have a tendency to think that human things are enough to take care of the problems. And though, Lord, you do raise up human tools, I'm not discounting that, but we leave you out of the center of the equation. And so, Father, thank you for the needs, whether it be in relationships, with wayward loved ones, with family needs, with husbands, wives, whether it be physical bodies. We know, Lord, that you got a solution for that. It's called a new body, and I'm looking forward to getting mine. Till then, help me to be a good steward of what I got. Thank you for raising this individual up that Steve prayed for, Lord, and others that have been given testimony of your hand to do what seems to be the impossible. We pray for a need of revival, and that means your people. This world's not going to be any difference until the truth and power of the gospel reaches their hearts. And we're the tools that you want to use to proclaim that clearly. So, Lord, we need to be fit tools. So may there be a revival in us so that there can be a change in our country. Lord, I pray for fathers this day, for families. Lord, I know that we are insufficient in and of ourselves. And it would be easy to curl back from the challenge. But Lord, thank you that you will give us strength. So Lord, we praise you for what you're going to do in this service and every service that preaches the truth. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Susan, got anybody to introduce them? Well, good. So um, I'm... I'm they, this is their second Sunday here, so I um, just want you to welcome Mickey and Mona, Gerald, and their great granddaughters today. And so, just get a chance to say hey to them before they leave, and and welcome them. And um, I, um, some there might be some other new faces, but I haven't had a chance to interact with them yet. But I'll introduce them as I, as I get to know people. Yeah. So, um, so glad to have you today. We want it, yay, and for everybody here. Uh, we want to build personal relationships. We want to get to know people because you can't really have happen in the church and do the work that should take place in the church until you build those relationships where you can be real around one another and share struggles and victories and things like that and have that support network. So, uh, yeah, we're thankful. Yes, Cameron. I'd like to introduce our friends back there, the Mueller's. The who's? This? The, the Mueller's. The Mueller's. Okay, I can remember that. So we've got Eric, uh, we've got Alex, and we've got Annabelle Mueller. They've come, I believe, once before, but we're, we're happy to have them here. Yay! Yeah. We are right there. All right. Is that got it? Okay. Ransom. <laughs> All right. Uh, go ahead, He's Donna. He's one month old. He's one month yeah. old. Right over here. Yeah, right over here. <laughs> The latest edition of the Pew Heritage is right there, so uh, we're thankful for that, thankful for them. <laughs> the Lion King? No. Oh, Simba! <laughs> oh, that's cute. Oh, thank God for His goodness and His mercy. Uh, for those of you who may think this is where to tea in witchcraft. Now, where did my anointing oil go? Well, we're going, uh, there's some. Uh, we're going to do something that the, that the Bible says. Um, in James, the last chapter, it says, Is there any sick among you? Let them call the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing with them oil. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. And if they've committed any trespass, God will forgive them. Because physical problems in our life can be tied with disobedience to God. We're not saying that's Vinda's situation. But Vinda's got problems with her her knees and, and, and stuff and has been having this for a prolonged time. And the oil is a symbol that she is submitting to God's purposes and her having this challenge. Now we believe that God takes anything and turns it for good if we love Him and we are 
called according to his purposes. So she, in being anointed with oil, is saying, Lord, I'm submitting to your purposes in me having this challenge. And if it is so pleasing to you, I'm asking you to heal this thing. And we've seen that God does those things. There are times where God says, no, I'm going to teach you that my grace is sufficient for you. And day by day, I will give you strength to do what you need to do, even in the midst of struggle. Those of you who are getting older, understand that. You get up and you think, oh, God, I can't move today. And you say, oh, God, give me strength, and God helps you through the day. So if I could have the, um, uh, some of the um, uh, deacons, if we'll come over here. You can slide over there for the moment. Yes. And uh, come around her. And once again, this is biblical. Look it up in James. We're not going to pull out snakes or anything for those of you. Uh, <laughs> not yet, anyway. Not, not yet. No. All right. Never. All right. <laughs> Father, I want to thank you that Vinda is your precious daughter, not only by the fact that you created her, but that she gave her heart and life to you. Her body belongs to you, and you've given it to her to be a blessing and not a curse. And so, Father, what Satan is trying to do in her body, we bind and we rebuke that because we have a blood covenant that he cannot kill, rob, and destroy if we are walking with you. You know what freedom she needs in her body. You know what strength she needs in her body. We know that you can use a lot of things. You can just supernaturally make it happen. So, Lord, she's submitting to you and your purposes and your plan. Cause her to trust you and not waver. And each day, expect the strength that she needs in her body to do what you've commanded her to do that day. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray these things. Amen. 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 All right. Um, we're going to um, take up an offering. And... Um, one of the things my daughter, we were talking this week, and she said, Dad, I really appreciate this about you, um, teaching biblical principles of money. The reason we take up an offering isn't because we need your money to operate. If we're honoring God, if you don't honor God by your giving here, God will supply through other sources. We honor God. It is an act of worship to say, God, you are my provider. I am looking to you to meet my, my physical needs. Not money, not material possessions. I look to you because you're a good dad. You're going to take care of me. Uh, how many of you have had kids you give them money and they spend it as quick as they can because they know you got more and they'll come and ask for it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, some of you know that, that type thing. Can I tell you this? As a good dad, if he gives us material possessions and we need more, not because we've disobeyed him or wasted it, but if we need more, God will provide. And so it is in that spirit that we take up this offering. And so we're going to have a word of prayer. Uh, if I have my volunteers, they'll come take up the offering, and then we'll do the announcements. Father, I want to thank you that you've been a good daddy to me. I've got more than I need. And Lord, thank you that I can share that with other people you give to me so that I can bless others. I want to thank you that you have given me a blessed life materially and help these people here to realize the joy of having stuff isn't the stuff. It's seeing it as a gracious expression of God's love and watch care over us. And so, Father, as we take up this offering, may that be the spirit that is given in and Lord, guide us in how to use it to see this turned into eternal value or it has no use for us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. I just knocked over a baby bottle, which we'll get to uh, while I have a baby bottle out at the pulpit. Anyway, if I could have my volunteers that are serving the Lord. I appreciate these young people that are anxious to do this because some of you adults is like drag, you know, pulling teeth. No, I'm picking uh, <laughs> Anyway, we'll go to the uh, announcements part. First of all, this is the last time she said she's doing this. Some people said that it did not get to them. If you have not had a chance to look at your picture and face uh, and make sure the information's accurate and want to, raise your hand, and I'll have somebody bring this to you right now. All right, you check that. Anybody else? If, 
All right, back there, Rosemary, if somebody, if you'll get it to them. But we, we're going to print this thing after today. So uh, she's printing on Wednesday, so check it out. Make sure it's there. Uh, today, 6 o'clock, we will have softball practice. If you've got fatherly things going on, don't come. But if, if you've already been celebrated and enjoyed and you want to be at softball practice, do. Next Sunday, we have in that afternoon, the ages are uh, 16 and up, not 12 and up is in, the, in this bulletin. 16 and up. We've got uh, tea times starting at 2.30. We'd like you to be there between 2 and 2.15. And if you are, uh, we want you to use it as an evangelistic tool. Invite somebody who may not be in church or not regular in church or just needs the fellowship to come and, and, and play golf. Uh, we have a good time. Uh, it's Captain's Choice format, and you can see the information there. Uh, sanctuary study group is going to be here tomorrow night uh, at 7 o'clock. Uh, you need to be here for that. You can see Jeff. Wave at me, Jeff. Jeff is the one for the contact with that there. Silent auction stuff. If you've been uh, in the fellowship hall, there's lots of items that are there. There's going to be a couple of more that are coming. But between now and after service next Sunday, uh, after service, there'll be your last time to put final bids in. You can start bidding now. Uh, but anyway, uh, the last bids will be at the, after the service next Sunday. Uh, and then a uh, quick little explaining to the, what it goes for, which is for the support of uh, Susan uh, Boston. She's a missionary at Christ in Action. And Dwight is wanting to come full-time, but they've got to raise that support for him also. So uh, Nancy's the one that, wave at me, Nancy. Nancy's the one that's helped putting this together. So if you have anything of value that somebody might be willing to bid on and some not too late to bring the stuff, see her about that, and we'll, we'll get it in there. But you can uh, begin on that. Ice cream in the park. Dwight, stand up and give us a yeah, one. For a, maybe a, a small country redneck church, we're getting a little technologically advanced there. QR codes. I'm impressed. <laughs> anyway, I'm thankful for the technology. I like the technology. I just don't know how to work it all. Anyway, and also VBS is coming up, so don't forget to be praying for that and involved in that. And uh, do you want to say anything else about that, Tiffany? See Tiffany about that if you want to. All right. I remind you about praying for Camp Red Arrow, Red Arrow. Their weeks of camps are going on right now. They've had people to come to Christ, and I've gotten really, really good reports about the things that God's doing there. And um, I know some of your young people will be going, and I know we've got people that are going to be uh, ministering there, myself, Jenny, others. So be in prayer for that. Um, I guess at that point, I didn't do Name That Tune, did I? I want to do Name That Tune before I ask everybody else to come up. So come on, we'll do Name That Tune, and then the rest of them can come up, and we'll sing the rest of the song. Mm -hmm. Oh, while you're doing that, before you start, I forgot about the baby bottle. It fell down, I didn't see. Um, those baby bottles are out there. You can take, they got a little slit in there. You just collect and put your change in that, and it's a fundraiser for the Pregnancy Center Life Spring uh, that we support. And when you fill them up, bring them back, and we collect them, and we take them there. I filled up one and grabbed two more, so uh, uh, if you would, do that. All right, Mr. Name That Tune. <laughs> I'm now found every blessing. All right, I love this song. Number 17, if you can, stand, do. If you can't, you can remain seated, and we'll sing all three verses. Oh 
can remain standing because they're going to come up and lead in song. But how many of you know what it means, here I raise my Ebenezer? For years, I thought it was a kid that the songwriter had named Ebenezer. It's actually an Old Testament <laughs> reference to something that was reared up by the children of Israel as a testimony. It was a monument, a rock of God's faithfulness to them, and it was called Ebenezer. So now you're smarter for being here. <laughs> oh, good morning. That was awesome. We should change it so everybody's already standing up. <laughs> Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you that we can come and praise you, Lord. Father, let this worship be an overflowing from our heart of gratitude for what you have done for us and what you still are doing. You are such an awesome, amazing, good, good Father. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy that's new every day that you sing over us. And Lord, you love us so much that you sent your son to die for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you did for us. And we want to praise you now. It's in your name I pray. Amen.
restoration. It was a year when then all the debts were wiped away. Jesus, we pray that you would come soon and restore us unto you. Behold, he comes, shining on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of sight till salvation comes. Behold, he comes, shining on the clouds, shining like the sun. seven days a week. Thank you, Jesus, that you are holy and worthy.
Shelby's going to come sing, but I'm going to let the children's church workers go out and the uh, children's church, if you'll go behind them. And this is, I blew the surprise. Uh, her dad didn't know she was going to sing. And so when I, I wished him a happy Father's Day, I said, and I know you excited about the gift you're going to give. And she looked at me like, thanks a lot. <laughs> But we trust it'll still be the blessing that she's designed it to be and thankful for her dad. So Shelby, when they go out and you're ready, go ahead and sing. Oh, okay, there we go. So yeah, in words of my dad, no one likes a rat. <laughs> I did truly intend to keep this a surprise until the last minute. I thought the diesel truck would give me away as I drove from my house over here, but um, you know, I guess this was the what God intended on how that surprise was going to come undone. Anyway, I'm going to sing um, You Raise Me Up. I think it's a fitting both Father's Day song and church song. So without further ado. Maybe turn this down just a little, the mic down just a little bit.
guess she couldn't have got you anything better for Father's Day than her singing that and uh, appreciation for you and also for God's gift to her as you being her father. The title of the sermon today is Calling All Heroes. Society, Satan, is using society to attack the family, the home. Because God designed the home to be an incubator for understanding truths about God and truths about ourselves and truths about life. And he knows if he can disrupt the home, then he can tear apart society and he can tear apart our ability to understand clearly who he is and the relationship that he wants to have with each one of us. And he knows... He has to take out the covering. Every man that is a head of a home, you're a covering for the people under your roof, for your wife, for your children. You are a covering. You are to take point. You are to be lead. There are things that if you do not do what God has designed you to do, are able to put pressure on your wife and on your children with demonic attack and influence that makes it that much harder for them to know God and to walk with God. It does not mean that they cannot. So let me encourage you, if your father didn't do what he should have done, or a husband, if you're a wife and your husband isn't doing what you believe he should do, that doesn't mean that God cannot be there for you as the ultimate father that he is. It just means that it's going to be harder for you to see those truths clearly with the lies of Satan echoing in your mind that he was able to hijack the man of the house to be able to put those wrong thoughts and feelings in there. And so, men, we have a call. We have a responsibility. We have an assignment that God has given you. I know that you don't feel worthy of it, but it's not about you. Your job is not to be God. Your job is to know God and to walk with Him in such a way that people can see who and what He is that are under your roof. And so, I know you feel unworthy of this assignment. Just like in most heroes, they're just, you know, when you hear heroes that are true heroes, they talk about, oh, I was just, I was, I'm, I'm nothing special. I'm just an ordinary person. The situation uh, was there and there was a need and, and I felt compelled to meet that need. Too many men are believing the lies of this world that men are not needed to be the leaders in their home that they need to be, to be the fathers, to raise up this next generation. I guarantee you that Satan knows the value of the next generation. And he is going after the next generation with full force. And the only thing standing against the wave of society, the wave of the teachings of this world, what demonic influence is trying to put in the hearts of the next generation, you are on the front lines to stop that from happening. Why? Why is that true? Would you put up Proverbs 17.6? This is why. God has designed an interesting principle for fathers. Grandchildren are the crowd of the aged. Amen to that, Mr. Malachi. Oh, I'm so thankful for my grandchildren. And the glory of children is their father. Now, ladies, that does not diminish in any way your role. But for God to teach as father the principles that he needs to be taught through the manliness of a man, the glory of children is their father, their hero. I asked some people today, uh, I said, what was your father's greatest weakness? And some of them couldn't think of anything. And some of them said, my father had these weaknesses, I said, uh, and, and it hurt our relationship. But they said they had an uncle that was really the father to them, that they needed, and they said he was perfect. You know, men... Whether you like it or not, you're your child's hero. 
And I'm going to show you in Scripture and through this dynamic, the glory of children. By that, shouldn't it be the glory of the Father is the praise of the children? No, the glory of the children. So I want to start out with the first part. Why are we their glory? Because God designed for we as fathers to be the source that builds our children's self-images. Their value, their importance, their identity, their purpose. Why? Because where are we supposed to get our value from, men? It better not be what we do, because you and I both know we fail and we're imperfect. We get our value from our Heavenly Father. Your value as a man, God, whether you like it or not, has chosen to give you the children under you. And that wasn't by mistake. God wants to use you to build their self-image, to teach them. Here's who God says you are because you've gotten your self-image from God. But if your self-image is based on what you can do, then that's going to flow down through your family and going to cause difficulties and problems. The self-image, the purpose, the identity. If your children do not have strong self-images, you need to ask yourself as a father, what have I done that has dismantled truths about who they are. Do you not believe that God gave you the children He did for a purpose? And each one of them has a special, unique design from God. Or do you believe they were just accidents or, or inconveniences or something that just biologically happens? So they get their identity. And so this next generation doesn't know who they are. That's why they pretend to be everything in the world because they're trying to find an identity that makes them feel loved and special and wanted and unique. And though they're chasing down all the wrong roads to try to find that, the glory of children is what they find that their father communicates to them that they are in their purpose and in their design. If you would, put up Psalms 127.4. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Do you know what an arrow is? An arrow is a tool that you use to send to a mark. God has given you these children and you've got to give them a sense of purpose. And study and know them. And their identity. My children were given to me that I may raise, that they may serve Jesus Christ with the talents and abilities that God has given them. That is the arrows that God has given me. And I am supposed to help them define what targets they're supposed to shoot at with their talents and abilities. But clearly, the target is, I need to serve God with who and what I am. That's why I was designed. That's what I, why I was created. And men, it is our job to communicate that. But we cannot communicate that until we believe that ourselves. God has entrusted you because He is going to use you. Second thing in them being the glory of the Father. So put up back uh, the Proverbs 17, 6. You set the standards of right and wrong. You help your young people know what's right and wrong. Somebody shared uh, in the movie The Courageous. Have you, any of you seen that movie Courageous? I rewatched it this week because I knew it was about fathering and fatherhood. And one of the guys was sharing there. He said, my father told me I better not drink. And he told me that with a bud in his hand. That's a mixed message. That's double standards. And if you want your young people, if you want your wife, if you want your family to know the standards of right and wrong, you the one that set the example. You set the example that lying is not right. You set the example that hard work is right. You set the example that you better be in church. That God's more important than anything else. 
You set the standard that reading your Bible and daily devotions, you set the standard of right and wrong, gentlemen. And what you do not set is set at a lower level that the standards are, ah, oh, church really doesn't matter. Honoring God with your money and talents really, really doesn't matter. You teach them a standard that it's about making money. It's about having more possessions, more cars, more boats, more houses, more this, more that. And you teach them the lie that this world says that this world is about accum uh, accumulating things. I mentioned to my Sunday school class today, because we're going verse by verse through the book of Ecclesiastes now. This generation coming up has get, been given more than any other generation. I told him, I said, when I was growing up, we had three channels and they were on a black and white TV. We had a telephone that was a party line and you had to go like this to dial it. One car per household. This generation has been given more and they are more miserable because they are at an earlier age realizing that things do not satisfy. Things are not the stuff of life. It leaves them empty, and they're looking for some meaning and purpose and design. And so they chase all these things that Satan tells them to chase because we've not set the standard. Proverbs 2, 1 through 5, if you put that up there, please. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and incline your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as much as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. We are a responsibility. We have that responsibility to say, here are the standards, here are the truths. We need to teach them. How God's word applies to real life. You say, what do you mean by that? You give an honest day's labor for an honest day's wage. I'm just how many of you, I, my, my earthly father died when I was two months old. But what I have observed in God as father is very practical and real. And what I've tried to teach my children is, when you're playing sports, you get out there and you give it 100%. If you watch my children, especially Jenny, I, I, I loved watching her play volleyball. When she would make a mistake, she would slap that floor and she would be mad for a moment and she would try that much harder to not make the mistake again. Because she realized playing sports was to the glory of God and you ought to give it your best. Things like you don't tear down your teammates. Just what did your father teach you? Some of you, he taught you how to hunt, how to shoot. Um, Joshua, when he was a um, little older than Malachi, when he was probably six to eight months old and I could stand him and hold his hands, guess what I had at his foot? had a little cloth soccer ball with a bell in it. And as he would walk and I'd hold his hand, he'd kick that little bell, uh, soccer ball and hear that bell. He loved that. I was teaching and training skill. Uh, all types of things. I could go into a lot of examples. But your job is to teach, train, discipline. I taught my children that hard work is the way to success. You say, well, that's a no-brainer. Have you realized what's being taught to our world today? Sit around and do nothing and somebody will provide for you. Somebody else will take care of the responsibility. You be irresponsible. Uh, there are so many things just because dads are not in the home. We know, I, I, I've thought about having all types of statistics about the probability of someone being in jail, the probability of someone having children out of wedlock, the probability of somebody being a drug addict. It all comes back to statistics when dads aren't in the home, teaching, training, that you don't do something just because you feel like doing it. I know there are times 
I, I'll tell this story, and I won't tell you where it's at now. how. Joshua was picking on Jacob. That was something that happened quite regularly. And this, this is their, their older teenagers. They're older teenagers. And if you know Jacob, he's very easy going, but he pulls it all in. But when it goes, it goes. And I heard them having some row in, in the house. And as I'm there, I hear, wham! Joshua did not get hit, but there was a hole in the wall. Jacob had enough discipline to not hit him, hit the wall. Why? Because he was trained. You don't do what you feel like doing on impulse. You do what's right. And so these things of teaching and training, that's the glory of the Father. That my dad has standards. My dad is exceptional. My dad holds up honor and rightful things and good things and honorable things, exceptional things. Not just mediocrity. Forgive me a little bit of a soapbox. I hate participation trophies where everybody gets a trophy. I'm for people getting trophies and, and, and hey, we're glad you played, you did good. But what you're teaching is it really doesn't matter. Everybody wins. So hard work is not rewarded. These type things, teaching discipline. There's a warning, though, I want to give fathers in, in the fact of teaching and training and disciplining, setting standards. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not pro provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Do you know what? There are many people that are having a hard time getting close to God because their dads were so hard on them. If they weren't perfect, they were put down, they were punished, they were dealt with as less, as being disappointing. And so these people think that's the way God is. And I can never get close to God because I, I, I make mistakes, I do things wrong. And so they don't come to church because they don't feel worthy of God's love. They, they feel like when they make a mistake, they might as well wallow in the sin and continue in it because they can never be pleasing enough. I warn you, men, have high standards, but you be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful to you. I've made mistakes as a father, as a husband. And I'm thankful to God that he's merciful to me. I'm thankful when my wife and my children are merciful to me. And I want to teach them that I believe in them. I'm not looking for them to always do right. I'm looking for them always to want to do right. I'm trying to build a hard attitude, not outward actions. Yes, we'll teach and train outward actions. We'll correct, we'll reprove, we'll do these things. But do your children believe you love them less when they do not meet the standard that you set up? I pray to my children that I have never made you feel like you were loved less when you didn't do what you should have done. God's not that way with me. I am so thankful. And God's not that way with us. So if we don't teach these things in the way we model men, we teach an austere God as you better do or punishment's coming. Loving correction should come. We should never deal with our children because they got on our nerves. And trust me, children can get on your nerves. <laughs> but you should never discipline because they're getting on your nerves. You discipline them because you love them enough to say, I want to correct this wrong thinking and feeling and behavior because I love you and I believe in you. So heed the warning, men. We're too much built on performance. I'm okay if my child colors outside the line as long as they're trying to color inside the line and they're giving me an expression of their love for me, trying to please me. So that warning's there. We teach them love and the, the forgiveness. We teach them we're their heroes because we teach them what God is like. We're the glory. God has designed that your children will want to be like you. 
There's a song that um, I forget who sings. I want to be just like you because they want to be just like me. I want to be a holy example for their innocent eyes to see. I want to be living by the law so my little boy can see. He wants to be just like you. I want to be just like you because they want to be like me. God has designed your children want to be like you. Whether I like it or not, my children want to be like their daddy. And I want to be something that is worthy of that dynamic because I am showing them what God is like. The greatest honor that God could ever give me is to say, Dwayne, the difference between the relationship you had with your children and what they began with me, the distance was very minimal. I hope that they didn't have a hard transition to build an intimate relationship with the Heavenly Father because of the way I had a relationship with Him. It was just a transition to a, God, a dad I could see who God was in to a God who I couldn't see that was like my dad. And men, that's our goal to make that distance just as short as possible between their relationship with God and what their relationship was like with you. My children know that God will chasten them because I chasten them. But I do believe they believe that God will do it in love and not to harm them because I never, never by the grace of God spank my children to harm them because I was angry and releasing the frustration out. <coughs> it's for their benefit. What's God like? Last thing on, on this part of the sermon, and don't worry, we'll, we'll get through it and get you out of here. <laughs> Victory over evil. I pray that my children have seen that, that I am living a victorious Christian life. That Satan comes against me. And the world comes against me, but it does not win against me. I stand against evil. I win. I walk a victorious Christian life. How are our sons and daughters going to believe they can live victoriously unless they see us living above sin? Now, that doesn't mean I don't struggle. My children will tell you, uh, but I will say this. I don't think the list would be real long of what they've seen. And I've had to make that right with God, make it right with them in, in any of those failures. And re they realize that I'm not the perfect father. I point to the perfect father. But they see a victory in me that they want in their lives. I believe that. I believe my wife sees in me a quality of walk with the Lord that says, I want that too. Because she knows she can have it. Because they know they can have it. Because they see the reality of it in my life. And should be. Victory over here. Superpowers of a dad. Superpowers of a dad. And we're just about finished. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your might. First superpower of your hero. Trust me. If it's about what you can do, men, you might as well walk out the door as failures. But I want you to know that your first superpower is seeking God wholeheartedly. Do you know why some of you do not seek God wholeheartedly? Because you know that in your own strength you'll fail. And you got too much pride to fail. And so you live in fear away from God. I fall down. But God picks me up. And bruised and battered, I continue to run the race. I continue to head toward that finish line because there is no other option in my heart. There is no other option in my life. My young people, my children, my wife know that following God wholeheartedly is why I exist. It is the breath in my lungs. It is the blood in my veins. It is the beat of my heart. Men, it's not about being perfect. It's about wholeheartedly saying, I want God first place. So give up your pride. Give up your self-sufficiency. 
but let them see a burning desire, even if you do fall, to go to your heavenly Father and ask forgiveness. And get up and run the race again. That seeking God. Second is time spent. And these words that I command you this day shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Well, how do you do that? Oh, when you, you talk with them, when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You know what the commodity, the money of relationship is? It's time spent. I challenge you to look up. How much the average dad spends on knowing the heart of their child, communicating to find out what's going on in their child's heart. It's only minutes per week. Oh, they'll talk to him about functional things. Take this out, do this, do that, do that. But taking time to listen to what's going on in the heart of your child and to sharing what's on your heart. There's no import, more important thing than you have than, than spending time with your wife and your children. Pouring into them. How much time, if I ask you, to, and I challenge you, I've done this one time. How much time do you spend with your children knowing what's on their heart? Saying, you know, what's going on? How are you doing? Uh, asking questions. And then sharing what I've found is when I'm willing to share my heart, they open up and share theirs. One of the things I love to do with my son Joshua, we, we golf. He beats me almost all the time. Every once in a while I do beat him, thank God for that. <laughs> Hadn't been lately in the last two years. Come close anyway. Let the pride go, Dwayne, let the pride go. Anyway, <laughs> but one of the, the beauty of, of it isn't the golf. We talk. In fact, he, uh, he doesn't realize I sa uh, heard him say this yesterday. But Sydney always asks him when he gets home after playing golf with me, so what would y'all talk about? Because she knows. She knows we're going to share our hearts. With Jenny, I had the privilege of uh, Friday. She went with me to visit Leon and Diana because she had some stuff to deliver there. And I got to take her out on a date for lunch. And it was so good just to hear what was going on in her heart and her mind. And for me, when God gave me an opportunity to share a little thought there or share a story out of my life here and there, that's what they remember. That's what they want. Time spent. And what my children are learning that have kids, man, they grow up so quick. My son John was talking about that yesterday. In the blink of an eye. Leon was talking about looking at Jenny. He said, how did you grow up in three days or, you know, such a short time? I remember you. You can't waste the moments. You can't waste the opportunity. The superpower is time spent listening to what's on their heart and you sharing what's on yours. Words of affirmation. I don't know that I have ever called any of my children stupid. I don't know. One of the rules in our home is you do not call people names. Now, sometimes I have to correct that. But, but I do correct it because I have, at times, when they were at their worst, dis when I was disciplined, said, listen, I know who you are, and those actions are not who you are. I believe in my children. I believe that God's created them for greatness to His glory. Maybe not great in the world eyes, but in impact, in pointing people to the Lord and helping them know Jesus in a real and vibrant way. I believe in them. I believe on the calling of their life. And I try with the best of my ability to communicate that in my words. I pray that I've never communicated to them that I was disappointed in them. Sometimes surprised at what they did. But listen, outside of the grace of God, we all sin. We all make mistakes. We all fall short. That's why it's about Jesus 
and not about us. Words of affirmation, unconditional love, prayer. Psalm 127, 1. And we're just about finished. Unless the Lord builds a house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the child, the home, the watchman stays awake in vain. Men, do you pray for your wives? Do you pray for your children? One of the things I would say to you, especially about the wives, is this. In Sydney, if he's not, it's partly my fault. I should love Donna in a way that my son's watched all his life and he knows how to love Sydney. How are they going to know how to build a strong family if they don't see it in us? In us building a strong family. They are going to imitate in their marriages, in their child rearing, what they saw at home. That'll be their starting point. Thank God God can teach and adjust from there. But that's the starting point. And so praying, I understand that my children are not going to turn out right unless God does it. And I hit my knees and pray for them every day, throughout the day. One of the things I said to Joshua about Malachi. I forget the context of it. But I was saying, son, do you not know that every day throughout the day, I wonder what's going on in your life and how you're doing? And I know you're an adult, and I don't bother you like I did when you were younger because then I was more accountable to make sure you were okay and to teach and train. But you're an adult now, between you and God. But I still wonder throughout the day, constantly, how are they doing? And as God puts things on my heart, I pray for my children. I pray for my, my children that through marriage, Sydney's my daughter. Prayer. The power of a praying dad. My dad died, as I said, two months old. But he prayed over me. And I know beyond a shadow of my doubt, when I get to heaven and see what God did and why he did in my life, part of it, it will be in response to that 45 minutes or so, an hour on his deathbed that he prayed over me before he handed me back to my mother and the nurses. Because prayer is powerful. And men, you need to be prayer warriors for your wife, your children, your family. You don't have to be some super saint. You just have to be a child of God. In the humbleness of your heart, cry out, oh God, if you don't do it, it isn't going to get done. I, in my own strength, can't do it. I can't. But it is the desire of my heart for you to build my house. I'm not going to wait for other people to teach and train my children. I'm not going to wait for the church to teach and train them about God. I'm not going to put it all on my wife to teach and train them. I am supposed to lead. And I'm supposed to be that frontline soldier. And so men, we've got this calling. Now I want to also encourage this part. If you've done that and are doing that with your own children, there are many children who need a father-like model. As I said, somebody said they had found it in an uncle and other people. The Bible talks about us men mentoring younger men. There are plenty of people who need to see a father-like heart in you and be there for them and mentor them. driving the school bus, coaching. I saw so many who needed to know what the love of a father was like. I know that you are struggling feeling like you are not enough. But God 
gave you who he gave you because he said, if you'll turn to him, he'll make you more than enough. So this Father's Day, men, would you put your pride aside? Would you put your trying to look like you got it all together and trying to be the hero in your own strength? And admit you have feet of clay, you make mistakes, you've done it wrong. You have to go back and say, I'm sorry. But from this point on, say, God, with what time I have left in my life, I want to be the glory of my children. I want to be the hero. I want to be someone's God model so that they know what you are like. God will forgive you. And God will empower you if you'll humbly, wholeheartedly seek Him this day. Let's pray. Oh, God. Oh, God. The assignment of being a husband and a father is the heartbeat of my heart. I want to win the world to, the, to you, Lord, but I want to start with my family. I want my children to know you and have a strong walk and pass it on to their children and their children and on and on through the generations. I cannot make that happen. You must empower me. You must purify me. You must keep me focused on task. There is an enemy trying to kill, rob, and destroy my home, my children, the next generation. Oh, God, I know you can keep it from happening to my world if I am faithful to you. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want this to be a time where people reflect. If you want to sing, you can. If you want to open your eyes to see the words, that's fine. But I would like you to pray for the fathers in your life. I'd like you to pray for those who haven't been the best fathers and forgive them. And realize their job was to make you hungry for the one and true father. During this invitation, you do whatever God puts on your heart. From wherever you've been, come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find mercy, O sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow. There's hope for the hopeless and all those who strayed. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure.
There's no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens and lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. I encourage you to find some man and make them believe that by the grace of God they can succeed in being a father and a husband, that they should be. So many of us know we've messed up. But there's nothing like an encouraging word, especially from a wife, from a child, an adult child, say, Dad, I believe in you. I believe in God's calling on your life. And I believe God's going to work in you. You may have to purify and hammer and sand and whatever, but I believe that God will help you succeed if you really turn to Him. So encourage somebody today. Let's stand for this message. Thank you for being the perfect Father because ultimately you're the dad we need to lean on, depend on, and you be the glory of our life because we're your children. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You're dismissed.